Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld, the director of the Watson Institute. It is my pleasure today to introduce Professor Hans Olaf Henkel uh, to speak about the topic of does Europe still need or want a United States of Europe? Dr. Henkel is a member of the European Parliament. He represents the party Alliance for Progress and Renewal, ALFA. Uh, as you all know, ALFA is a part of the par parliamentary group European conservatives and reformists. Uh, I can't speak and won't speak for you, Dr. Henkel, but I think it's fair to say that you are a Euroskeptic, if I may, uh, and at least in terms of uh, common currency and maybe continued Greek participation in the EU. But I will for sure let you explain your, your views. Uh, I personally believe this, this talk comes at a very important time, an important time for Europe, uh, but also an important time for North America. It's a time when Europe is facing a number of questions about uh, the sustainability and desirability of the EU and European unity more generally. There are challenges, of course, on the fiscal front, equity challenges, challenges of employment, challenges on the security front, challenges involving displacement and migration, many challenges. It's also a time, not just in Europe, but a time globally when democratic institutions are coming under fire for their <coughs> efficacy, coming under fire from the left and from the right. And personally, I believe these kinds of debates, whether they happen with respect to Europe or North America or anywhere else, these are the kinds of debates we should be having at Watson um, from across the political spectrum. I want to mention uh, a little bit more about Professor Henkel's background. I'm sure you're already familiar with this, but Professor Henkel had a very distinguished career in business at IBM. Uh, he had been president, he became president of IBM Germany in 1987, and he subsequently headed IBM Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, um, beginning in 1993. From 1995 to 2000, Dr. Henkel was president of the German Federation of Industries, the BDI, and from 2009 to, to 2012, Professor Henkel uh, lectured as an honorary professor of economics at the University of Mannheim. Uh, Professor Henkel will speak today for oh, roughly 35, uh, 40 minutes, and then his talk will be followed uh, by a, uh, a presentation by Professor Nicholas Ziegler, who's a political scientist here at the Watson Institute, and uh, also uh, Professor Mark Blythe, who's a political scientist also at the Watson Institute, uh, may offer some comments of his own and will moderate the Q&A session that we'll, uh, <clears throat> that we'll finish up with. Without any further ado, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Henkel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this invitation. If you see a slight nervousness here, stage fright or so, then this is due to the fact that my wife is here today uh, and also that uh, my ex-boss in IBM, Dave McKinney, is here today. And uh, with Dave, Dave was... Uh, one of my predecessors when uh, IBM had a big headquarters in Paris. We had in Europe 90,000 employees then and uh, a headquarters of 2,000 people. I tell you that because uh, today there is no more IBM Europe. And uh, if you ask Bayer Leverkusen or Daimler-Benz or Nestle or whoever, they don't have any more headquarters in Europe. They are either globally oriented or they are nationally oriented. But uh, there is no more uh, multinational company to speak of which believes that there is something like a European customer. There is a German customer or a Bavarian customer or a British customer or a Belgian customer but no European customer. This is sort of the opening story. I should also mention that together with Dave, I spent all my life in the information technology business, starting from punched cards up to the internet. Punched cards, I don't know whether you know what that is. Uh, the the uh, older ones, I mean, some of the men will perhaps remember. By the way, talking about older ones yesterday, my wife and I bought two tickets for 
To Kill a Mockingbird for the theater here in Rhode Island, which we will see tomorrow. And I noticed, looking at the price ranges, that there was a category seniors. So if you say that you are a senior, you were supposed to get a cheaper ticket. So we both were there, and I said, I'm a senior. And she said, well, look, uh, you are not yet 65. And I said, no, I am 76. No, no, I don't believe it. So I didn't get a <laughs> rebate, but I must tell you, this was uh, money well spent. <laughs> this, this made my day, if not the entire trip. <laughs> So uh, <clears throat> my speech here is supposed to answer a question. You heard the question. And since I'm German and you are maybe afraid of a too long speech, which you don't have to, I have decided to break my speech into three sections. And I ask myself three questions now, uh, which I will answer for you. That has two advantages. For you, it has the advantage that you always know where I am and you see sort of the end inside, possibly. And for me, it has the advantage I only have to ask myself questions for which I uh, am reasonably sure I have good answers. But unfortunately, I was already threatened here by having to face then your questions. So it will not be so easy. Here, easy. here are the three questions. Now, number one is, what has Europe achieved so far? Number two is, what are the reasons for the current crisis? And number three, what should we do in Europe? And then later we'll answer the overall question. Should we go for a United States of Europe? Now let me get to the first question. What have we achieved so far? I would say basically two important things. Let me start with the less important. The common market, which is in place now since a couple of decades, is possibly the main reason for the wealth, the growth, and the employment in the European Union. And it tells me what I always knew, and I learned that also in IBM, having worked most of my life outside my home country for this company. It taught me that uh, wherever we get to a system of uh, a market-driven economy, we create wealth. and. Uh, Within the European Union, we have not only embraced that system of market-driven economies, we also have created a very large common market. And for me, it's very clear that this has been the major reason for the enormous resurrection after the Second World War. Of course, one should not forget the fantastic contribution the United States made at that time with the Marshall Plan, but and uh, by telling the Europeans to embrace what is uh, what I could also call the capitalistic system on that continent. So very clearly, the fact that we have a common market and a market-driven system in Europe is uh, the basic big achievement or one of the large achievements in Europe. The second one is, well, uh, Dave McKinney reminded me uh, of it during lunchtime. And he is 100% right. Of course, we have now for 70 years peace in Europe. That is a fantastic achieve achievement, of course, even more important than the first one. But uh, very often when I am asked, uh, whom do we owe this peace? Uh, you get answers like, uh, well, uh, for instance, the euro. The euro was meant to be a system guaranteeing peace in Europe. But uh, quite frankly, I don't think that that is the reason for the peace. The peace in Europe is a result of the fact that all countries in the European Union have embraced the idea of democracy. And uh, if you think about it, you could make a couple of statements. Number one is there is no democracy in the world without a market-driven economic system. There is none. That doesn't mean that that statement also works the other way around. There are some countries having embraced a market-driven economic system which are not yet democracies. But be it as it may, uh, a fact is that democracies can apparently only work with a market-driven economic system. And the other thing is there has never been a democracy attacking another. 
There have been democracies attacking dictatorships. There have been dictatorships attacking democracies. And there have been dictatorships attacking other dictatorships. But never has there been a democracy attacking another democracy. So the real reason for peace in Europe has nothing to do with, in my opinion, with the Euro or other ideas, but basically with the fact that we have democracies. And it is very important that we maintain democracies in Europe. And if we are suffering from, let's say, viola violations of contracts or from decisions which are made somewhere without a democratic leg leg legitimacy, then I think we run into a risk. We should never risk democracies in Europe. Now, so this is, if you wish, the answer to my first question. Two answers. Again, market-driven economic system, common market, and democracies. That is what Europe stands for. I might add, though, that, and I learned that in the European Parliament, where I am not only in the, uh, com in the uh, Committee of uh, Industry, Research, and Energy, but I'm also on the Human Rights Committee, I learned one other thing, which belongs to the answer, that, uh, <clears throat> to the answer number one, that uh, Europe is a very eloquent spokesman of human rights worldwide. I should say that the Euro there is no parliament in the world which has such credibility, such power, and such drive pushing human rights all over the world. Uh, you see this, uh, for example, by the yearly uh, contribution of the European Parliament to determine the winner of the Zakharov Prize, which are usually being given to people who really deserve it. They have never been wrong in the Zakharov Prize, something you cannot really say for the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, which some people have gotten. They should never have gotten it, and some people got it without having done anything. Uh, I forgot who that was, though, I must say. <laughs> but uh, maybe uh, Dave can remind me of it. But be it as it may, <clears throat> so I think uh, the European Parliament has a very strong voice in spreading the idea of human rights. So, uh, which brings together my f famous, or my, uh, I shouldn't say famous, my personal favorite, the, the uh, sympathetic tri triangle consisting of market-driven economy, democracy, and human rights. Every country which has that is in good shape. And a country which doesn't have that is not in good shape. Let me get to the second question. What is the reason for the current crisis in the European Union? I don't think I have to explain to you much that there is a crisis. First of all, there is an economic crisis, especially in the Eurozone, those countries which are part of the Euro. Those countries, uh, in those countries, the growth has been uh, uh, almost non-existent in the last 10 years. And uh, within the Eurozone, there is one country which has grown quite well. This is Germany. Why has it grown quite well? Because a one-size-fits-all currency automatically creates problems for some countries when the Euro is too strong, like Greece or France or Spain. And for other countries, this currency is much too weak, like for Germany. So uh, for us, it's very easy to export right now because from a German perspective, from the perspective of a German exporter, the euro is undervalued. It should be, many people say, about one, dollar, uh, one euro to one dollar sixty. Uh, it is, however, uh, at one twelve. Now, if, on the other hand, the euro was and still is much too strong for the southern European countries, you see a logical result. They can't export their goods anymore. And imports from Germany are very cheap. And that's the main reason for the fact that the South and Europe got into tremendous problems. I'll give you just a few figures so you have a feel for it. The uh, unemployment rate in France is 12%. In Spain, is 28 The youth unemployment rate in Spain is almost 50%. And in Greece, is over 50%. 
which is a dramatic result, ladies and gentlemen, because that means that a whole generation of young people doesn't work and doesn't know what to do and uh, probably is prone to some crazy ideas uh, which they may pick up from some radical parties from the left or from the right and so on. So there's no question that economically the euro creates havoc in Europe. But if it was only economically. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, some of the reasons for the euro was uh, to maintain or guarantee peace in Europe. Well, let me give you a few examples. In May 2010, that was the time, the first time, uh, the first Greek package, rescue package, had to be financed primarily by Germany and a few other countries. In May 2010, Germany was the most liked country in Greece. The European Commission always does these kind of uh, uh, um, polls. They ask regularly, at least once a year, uh, a representative section of each country, which country men are in Europe, you are the ones you like most. And you can't believe it, but it is true. Germany was, in Greece, the most liked country in May 2010. Meanwhile, uh, Chancellor Merkel has been in Athens twice and had to be protected by thousands of policemen. Why? The German-French relationship are today as bad as they were, not where, worse than in the last 50 years. Why? Because the French have a totally different idea about economic system and culture than the Germans. The Germans hate inflation. The French don't mind. The Germans... Uh, are not uh, concerned if there is not much growth. The French need growth. The French, if they were unable to reform their system, could devalue. Well, in a common, common currency system, you can't devalue. So if a country is unable to do the necessary reforms and can't devalue, then it will not grow. Hence, you are having all these austerity programs in the south of Europe which uh, are a direct result of this common currency. In the past, uh, there was always a possibility for countries either to reform or to devalue or have a mixture of both. And the problem is that we have chosen in Europe, at least in the Eurozone, to uh, try to change the economic cultures which existed since decades, if not a longer period, to adjust those cultures to fit a common currency. I believe a currency, a currency should reflect the different cultures. We should do it the other way around. I should admit here that I was <clears throat> once fighting for the euro. When I was in charge of German industry, I, for instance, went to the Swedish Industry Federation because they asked me for, to help them to justify and, uh, the euro to the Swedish community. I did this. I went to Stockholm and gave a speech, and I decided not to tell them that the euro is so great. I, I said, look, if the euro comes, you, of course, have to take it, because you, small Sweden, with your Swedish crown, you would go down under. Well, fortunately, the Swedish constitution stipulated that the Swedish public had to, uh, in a referendum, to decide whether they wanted the euro or what, whether they wanted to stick to the crown. And the public decided, we want to stick to the crown. Today, 73% of the entire Swedish business community is in favor of the Swedish crown. 91% of the Swedish public does not want the euro. And they are very happy not to have made the mistake. I made that mistake. I could also say, well, was that a mistake? Or did I change my mind because the politicians did not adhere to all the promises they gave us when we gave up the DMARC? I, I usually choose the latter explanation because they really did uh, break all promises. One promise was that there was a so-called no bailout clause, a very important clause in the Maastricht Agreement which prohibits a, any country to help another country. This no bailout clause was put into the contract against strong French opposition by the then deputy fine, min fine minister, uh, finance minister, 
uh, of Germany. <clears throat> that deputy uh, finance minister became later uh, the head of the German Savings Association. Then he became the head of the IWF. And finally, he was the president of Germany. And Horst Köhler, which is his name, was very proud of having put this clause into that contract. And Horst Köhler had then to sign the first bailout agreement for Greece. And two days later, he went with his wife to the press conference and said, I resign as the president of Germany for personal reasons. So far, we still don't know why he really resigned. I think I know. But uh, nobody has ever been uh, has ever been told officially why he resigned. Why was this Nobel clause so important? Well, let me pull you back to the 26th of July, 1943. At that time, I was three and a half years ago, uh, three and a half years old, and I stood in front of the burning house of my parents. Uh, a, 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 a bomb has hit the uh, the roof, and it started to uh, in, get uh, inflame the whole house. And my father saved his wife, myself, my, my my sister, and my brother were somewhere else. Were somewhere else. Why do I tell you the story? Because my father went back into this house took a 60 millimeter camera, loaded a film, and filmed this burning house, which was forbidden at that time. But he did. And I still have that film. Of course, today it's on, on DVD, and my children and my grandchildren have it. And whenever I look at this film, sort of every, every three years or so, I, I notice something. This house was built next to another house. And that house was, was uh, standing there without any effects from the fire from our house. Why? Because there was a firewall between these two houses. And the German construction law uh, makes sure that if you have built houses next to each other, you construct a firewall. This no bailout clause of the Maastricht Agreement was a firewall between the German taxpayer and politicians of Southern Europe. And this firewall was taken down uh, by Frau Merkel um, upon a lot of pressure by the French government. And ever since, we are on the slippery slope of a currency where whenever some politician in one country does something which costs money, all politicians of the other countries have somehow to finance the situation. And my experience, which I had learned in IBM, is that you must have clear responsibilities. If everybody is for everything responsible, then nobody is responsible. And that's exactly the situation of the European currency today. We now have, as a logical result of the common euro, we now have a banking union. The banking union means what? The banking union means that the German saving savers, or the Dutch or the Austrian savers, who have their money in the banks, are now also vouching for the problems which might come up in banks in other countries in Europe. So we are socializing the risk, which is a logical result of the euro, of course. So <clears throat> whereas the idea of the European Union was to compete between countries, you now have to do, because of the euro, the opposite. You must harmonize. And uh, if, you have a harmon if you harmonize tax rates in Europe as a result of the euro, you can imagine what the result is. The, the tax rate will not necessarily uh, adjust itself to the least, but more likely to, the, to those countries where the tax rates is higher. So the eurozone goes into harmonization from the idea of competition. It goes into centralization rather than to the, from the idea of subsidiarity. And it goes to socialization rather than to follow the idea of self-responsibility of a country for its own debts. So you see here the, the real reason for the current problem uh, of Europe, both economically and politically. Let me make a little side point here, Britain. In May 2010, nobody in Britain knew Farage. This was some crazy guy who had a little party called UKIP, which uh, promoted getting out of the EU. And the acceptance in Great Britain of the EU was in May 2010 at an all-time high. 
Now, Britain doesn't have the euro, so you might think Britain shouldn't suffer from the euro. But Britain saw what happened on the continent as a result of the euro. Harmonization, centralization, socialization, that's something the Brits don't want. And by the way, I don't want also. And I can only tell you, if as a result, as a byproduct of this centralization, harmonization, and socialization, Britain leaves on the 23rd of June, then Europe will be in trouble. Not so much Britain itself, because I personally think Britain can survive, and they will certainly get a similar agreement with the rest of the European countries like Switzerland and Norway, which are also not a part of the European Union. But to put it bluntly, if Britain leaves, then the last country with common sense leaves the European Union. And Britain shouldn't leave, so I will do everything possible. And as a German, I may perhaps add that Britain is the second largest net contributor to the European Union, and guess who is picking up the bill if they leave? So you have here, a, I think, a, a person who for many reasons believes we should do everything possible to keep uh, Britain in the European Union. Now let me get to the <clears throat> last question. What am I in favor of? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think the idea of a United States of Europe is a good idea. By the way, it is a no contract. It is not part of the Lisbon contract. It's certainly not part of the Maastricht Agreement. But the idea of United States of Europe got a lot of push because of the problems caused by the common currency. Because what these people said, they said, oh, we have too little Europe. So in order to solve the problem, we must have more Europe. And the idea of the United States of Europe as a result of the euro grew among certain quarters, certainly in Germany and certainly in Brussels. Is that a good idea? Well, look, you have, we have the United States of America. Since 200 years, you have a common currency, and it works. But nobody in Texas would ever dream of bailing out California. But we do this already with Greece, although we are not yet a country. And of course, everybody in this country speaks English, or most. But in Europe, we have 24 languages. So this is a, a different situation. And I now live also in Brussels. And I notice, not only because of those things which happen right now, which uh, bother us, of course, and make us very sad, this, for me, Belgium is almost a failed state. And one of the reasons is they come together with two and a half languages, with Flemish and French and a little German. It doesn't work. They had for 18 months no government because they couldn't agree. And uh, I come back to my opening statement. When IBM had a headquarters of Europe, there is no European customer. I also don't know of a European restaurant. I have never heard of a European football team. So the idea is rather, rather artificial. I believe in a Europe of sovereign states, bound together with the European Union, primarily on economic grounds, which has been very successful. But for Christ's sake, do not try to get this multinational superstate. And I'll give you three examples of superstates which failed. Take the Soviet Union. It was not only the communism which failed. As soon as the communism disappeared, this whole thing collapsed. Suddenly we learned there is something more than the Soviet Union. There is Ukraine. There is Latvia. There were other countries which we didn't much heard, heard, uh, hear about. Or take Yugoslavia. Well, after uh, Tito went and the uh, uh, socialism uh, went uh, away, we suddenly discovered there was Croatia and Serbia and Slovenia and so on. And these countries wanted to be alone. So whenever you get to the situation that you take nations together under an artificial uh, ideology, be it communism or, in this case, the euro, this has to fail. This is, in my view, has no future. So here you have somebody who uh, believes 
that we must go back to what the European Union was supposed to be. It was General de Gaulle who had the idea that the EU should be a, a, a group of Vaterländer. He used this word uh, in German, as a matter of fact, or sovereign nations. And that's exactly what I'm in favor for, which does not mean that Brussels has no mission. Brussels can do a lot of things, but Brussels should do only those things which Brussels can do better than those countries individually. And there are a lot of things we st still don't do. In this country, you have a countrywide air traffic control system. In Europe, we still don't have. If you fly from Berlin to Paris, you are likely to be circling around for 45 minutes because there is no coordination between the air traffic controllers in Berlin and Paris because we don't have it yet. So there are certain things which we should do in Europe, but there are many things we should not anymore do. And if we continue for a centralized uh, United States of Europe, we will just achieve the opposite. We will not maintain peace and we will certainly lose our economic uh, advantages which we have created in the last 20 no, 40 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, I <clears throat> believe my role is as designated discussant. I'd like to thank uh, Herr Henkel for this very stimulating talk and uh, raise a few questions about it. Um, as uh, Director Steinfeld mentioned, I'm a political scientist. I tend to study, in fact, national economic policies, but I'm a continual observer of the European Union, and I do teach courses on European integration. Um, so I'd like to sketch um, a slightly different uh, image of potential directions toward uh, addressing the current crisis in Europe. Um, and I think I would begin by uh, uh, saying that what we've heard is a very um, enlightened and reflective critique of the current state of integration in Europe. There are a whole spectrum of skeptical views of the integration process, which uh, of course began with great optimism, uh, but there are also uh, voices um, on the center left of the political spectrum um, which for different reasons are skeptical of the way Europe has developed, that is the European Union, since Maastricht. And um, here I'm thinking mainly of commentators who believe that Europe does need something more than a common market. Um, it needs perhaps not a United States of Europe, but it does need a more solidaristic set of social policies that could support uh, the costs of market competition. Um, I think this is the main challenge to the critique uh, that Professor Henkel has uh, put forth, and um, I'm really relying on uh, German social democrats as much as anything else, people like Fritz Scharpf uh, in Cologne, for those of you who study the uh, German debates, but the underlying logic here is that from the 1950s onward, the primary uh, engine of European integration was exactly as uh, Professor Henkel says, um, the growth of a common market and the liberalization of national boundaries or the dismantling of obstacles to market transactions and trade. This was the explicit goal of the Treaty of Rome, and uh, some observers had said uh, that as good as this was, with time, Europe needed more 
of a centralized welfare policy, which it didn't have. So if we fast forward to the Single European Act of the 1980s and then the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, I think the question becomes, um, what were the chances then for a shared social welfare policy? And if we fast forward further to the current crisis, the discussion is whether there's some kind of fiscal pact or unified fiscal policy that would help European integration move forward. I think this is precisely what uh, Professor Henkel is questioning, whether the idea of having a unified fiscal policy, tax authority in Brussels, the ability to allocate major portions of European assets from Brussels, whether that's a good idea. And, and um, he's arguing that for all the reasons he said it's not a good idea. My question is whether there isn't some intermediate point. Um, I, I tend to agree that the idea of a United States of Europe is too extreme, but I wonder if something more needs to be centralized than simply market rules, freedom of contract, and the self-responsibility of economic actors as well as the sovereign uh, member countries. And here, let me um, simply mention that the total budget of the European Union now is, it's non-trivial, but it is only 1.24, 1.25% of the gross domestic products of the member countries. That's a relatively small contribution. So the counter argument here is, wouldn't a larger contribution, nothing equivalent to a United States of Europe, enable the European Union to perform more tasks to help finance responsibly weaknesses in the banking systems of different member countries without, in fact, raising the specter of a completely unified or centralized economy. Um, and this, I believe, might enable Europe to move forward without unwinding the two great achievements that we've seen so far. And I'll, I'll simply mention um, uh, what those are. Uh, Professor Henkel, of course, emphasized one of them, the euro, uh, which is unquestionably one of Europe's great achievements, and it has boomeranged. I think there's no doubt about this. It was based on a uh, political understanding that did not fit, for all the reasons we've heard, uh, the objective dynamics of monetary policy. But the other great achievement of Europe is freedom of movement through the Schengen system. If Europe cannot find a way to move forward, if there is a withdrawal to more national uh, <clears throat> uh, self-responsibility, and if, under the current uh, pressures of the refugee crisis that includes the dismantling of freedom of movement, then I think we have to confront much more serious questions of whether the member countries can continue um, to exist in as amicable a uh, situation as they have had so far. In other words, um, if we make a political choice to get rid of the euro as a single currency, and there are very good reasons for doing so, can we only unwind the single currency without unraveling the foundation for peaceful relationships within Europe? And this is my major concern. Um, let me just summarize very quickly by saying, you know, politics is supposed to be the realm uh, of uh, controlling our collective fate. And the European project was initially um, a very dramatic effort in raising governmental functions to a supranational level in an effort to create a better future for Europe uh, going back s five, six decades ago. Um, and we would like to think that we can analyze the situation in Europe now and come up with an adequate uh, solution that will, uh, <clears throat> that will continue our ability to uh, control our own collective fate and to maintain um, the existence of democratic politics, the protection of human rights, 
and the growth of market economies in Europe. Uh, but I think the talk we've heard shows just how difficult that is. So the question I want to raise is, can we remove one piece of the status quo, namely the single currency, and be confident that we won't also be removing a key part of the foundation for uh, these other achievements that Europe, uh, that Europe has, uh, has reached? And uh, since I can sense that there are many other questions, um, I'd like to wrap it up there. Uh, with that single, uh, with that single question, how much of the foundation can we remove without weakening it in ways we might not anticipate? Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I'm going to prattle on for five minutes because it's my right, um, and it's my right because I'm a Brit. Now you know, you know that I'm a Scot, right? But I'm actually identified as a Brit because I'm not a nationalist. Because the Scots are completely incoherent on this. They want to have a giant welfare state and they don't like George Osborne. So if George Osborne votes to get them out, they're going to apply to join the Euro, which means they will then have Dr. Schable running their welfare state, <laughs> which is not what you want if you want a big welfare state. So this makes no sense. So that's the first point. The second point is the point about Belgium. Belgium is a failed state. I have a wonderful graph, which I, if I had slides I could show, which is the, sort of the GDP track compounded of all the different Euro, currents, Euro countries going into 2007. Then they all go together in the shock. They all go down. Now, then you get the different tracks of them coming back up, right? But none of them come back up to trend almost, and, and the Greeks really just keep going down. But can you guess the country that actually comes back up to trend first? Les Belges. It's the Belgians, right? Here's another interesting one. Um, the 2015 election in Portugal left them with no government. And the bond markets didn't care. There was no additional pressure on the bond markets. Um, Spain was exactly the same recently. So the lesson I'm learning from this whole thing is that if you're in the euro, it's best not to have a government. <laughs> because then there's no one around to screw things up. So that might be a sort of a non-trivial finding. Uh, on, on more serious notes on this one, as a Brit, I'm actually genetically Eurosceptic. I am. And as I've written down myself, there's not much distance between us on very many issues. I have written down that the, Euro was a, the, U, the European Union is a fantastic idea as a political construction. It has taken democracy, human rights, and the rule of law all the way from the Iberian Peninsula right up to the borders of Russia. And that regard has been an incredible success. The next line I write, the Euro has been an unmitigated disaster. It is a monetary doomsday device. So I would take perhaps an even harder line on this one, and, I, and I'm willing to defend that one. Now, why is this the case? Uh, let's pick on someone, or rather, let's invoke someone who I heard this from, who is not very popular in Germany. And uh, his name is Yanis Varoufakis, and uh, the former Greek finance minister. And he had a lovely way of He's thinking about it. What's that? He's popular in He's po yeah, those are very minor circles in Berlin. <laughs> the very minor circles in Berlin Raucher bars. Come, light, dude, light, lighten up, please. Come on, lighten up, eh? Um, so I will invoke Yanis, and he said something very, very um, significant, which he said, okay, so let's think about how the crisis dynamics unfold in the United States, United Kingdom, and then the new European Union. And exactly as been said, you cannot devalue, you cannot inflate your way out of trouble, you have all the restrictions of having a common currency, and that explains some of the variation. But crucially, the question asked by the elites on the Atlantic side, the Anglo side, and the European side were very different. The Anglo-American said, oh my God, a monetary hydrogen bomb has just gone off. What do we do to triage the system and save everyone's assets? So they basically bailed, recapitalized, took the losses, booked them, and moved on. Europe still hasn't done that. The banks are still filled with NPLs. They still haven't actually resolved the fundamental banking circuits problems. And the idea of creeping towards a banking union and socializing these risks is exactly part of that legacy which was not dealt with in 2007. Now, this is what Yanis said about this, which I thought was very insightful. He said, not just was that the fact, the question asked was by the Americans, how do we bail this? The question asked in Europe was, how do we save what we've built so far? And that leads to a very different set of conclusions about what you need to do, because it's about maintaining institutions which are half finished in the eyes of those who are the builders in Brussels and in other places. Now, this makes you think a very different way about money. 
because we accept the pound or the dollar as a kind of sovereign currency. And with sovereign currency, you can do many, many things with sovereign currencies. You can bail your banks. You can do anything you want. You can, you can basically enforce control over your central bank if you have to and print money and do all these things. You can't do that in the common currency. But the common currency was meant to be a sovereign currency. It was meant to be sovereign money. But that conversation stopped in 2002. And no one picked it up again. In fact, it arguably stopped in 1992. So at that point in time, you have sovereigns with non-sovereign money with a central bank that doesn't know it's a lender of last resort. This is not lining up well and explains much of the dynamics as to what has happened. One other area I will agree here wholeheartedly is the European Union's response to the crisis. That is to say, how do we defend what we've built so far, imperfect though it is and dysfunctional though it is, leads to this bizarre dynamic whereby the objective is to make the economies of these very different economies more like the theory rather than adjusting the theory to fit the economies. I couldn't agree more on that. We don't have an optimal currency area, but my God, we're going to try and make one, and we're going to beat these institutions into submission, whether it's going to be done through fiscal policies, whether it's going to be the fiscal compact. We're basically going to make fiscal policy illegal in terms of what you can do in Brussels, etc. So these are all big issues. But I want to address one final thing and push even beyond where Dr. Hinkle has gone here. I think there's an United States of Europe that has been built that you, know, you lot haven't noticed yet. Because you really have to pay attention to find it very, very hard. And I'll give you a couple of numbers to suggest this one. And I'm happy to send you the data on this if you want to check it out. So in 2010, before the first Greek rescue, there was a total of 50 billion euros of Greek debt that was outstanding for what's called a rollover risk. Somebody had to buy it and basically repurpose it and send it out again. No one ever pays their debt. You retire some US you new stuff. That's how it works, right? So at that point in time, the ECB, if it actually thought it was a central bank, could have simply purchased this, called it something like the Sovereign Hellenic Investment Trust, just as an idea, right? Stuck it on its balance sheet, called it an asset, had a corresponding liability in cash, and everyone would have forgot about it. No spike, no panic, no crisis. We couldn't do that. 50 billion, moral hazard, you're responsible for other people. Do you know how much Poland has been given since 2002 in structural funds and other funds? 65 billion euros. You know how much we've given the Hungarians? 12 billion euros. You know how much total expenditure there is on the integration and upgrading of the infrastructure of the candidate member states in the Eastern European states? 130 billion euros. Yet there's no money for Greece. Now, what have we been doing? We've been upgrading all this infrastructure, creating common standards, building all this stuff. And at the same time, German capital has been incredibly active because all those countries basically depreciated their capital stocks to zero. And Germany equity investment has been very, very active over the past decade, integrating the plants and equipment so from Hungary and from Romania and from the Czech Republic directly into the supply chain of the German export complex. So we have built the United States of Europe. It's not west of the Elbe, it's east. Now, who is butt up against that? Who is the person who sees this as a threat? His name's Vladimir. You might have heard of him. And he is extremely upset at the moment because everyone, it seems, from his point of view, is denying that we're doing this. All we are doing is enforcing democracy and rule of law. No, you're building a United States of Europe right up against his fence, and he really doesn't like it. Now, the EU spends less than 2% on defense. The Germans on their own do not want to get into a street fight with the Russians anytime soon. The United States has lost its mind in its electoral process and might actually elect Trump, <laughs> at which point in time, all bets are off. So I'm actually more frightened about the United States of Europe we've actually built that no one wants to talk about than the one that the Eurocrats in Brussels dream about, or the packages of enforcement that they try and foist on other Europeans. And I'll leave it there. And let's have some questions. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Go ahead. What are the security implications of the mess that we've gotten ourselves into in Europe? How do you see the security situation? <clears throat> well, internally, 
I would like to differentiate between internally and externally. Internally, I would say <coughs> we have a big problem. Uh, yesterday, when my wife and I entered Boston Airport, we had to give our fingerprints, all 10, and they took a photograph of us. And we had to tell them when we boarded the plane in Germany where we are going to go and what we are doing in this country. For Merkel has come up with a policy where hundreds and thousands of people have entered Europe without even leaving their names. So we have a colossal security problem in Europe, which is now, uh, in my view, uh, accelerating because of the current refugee policy by Germany. It's only Germany. All other countries follow a different policy, including the moral superpower Sweden. External, uh, externally, I do not see really that Europe has a big role here. I rely on NATO, full stop. Much more important. We have people in Europe, especially also in Germany, who believe we should have a European army or things like this. I don't think so. I think this makes no sense. We owe our security, thanks again, to the United States uh, when the Soviet Union was as, aggra as aggressive as it was. And we will, in future, have to rely on the United States if Putin continues like he does. Nick, do you want to get in on this? Well, that's part of the foundation, uh, which I worry about. Um, if the United States begins to withdraw its commitment to Europe, of course, um, then I think the happy coincidence of European integration and NATO may begin to fragment. Uh, and this is the litany of the U.S. Uh, security community <coughs> that the United States cannot provide a security umbrella for Europe um, indefinitely. I happen to agree with that skepticism, but I'm not making foreign policy in the United States. Um, so I do have to wonder whether a fragmenting European Union will also lead to the gradual uh, uh, divergence of NATO members um, as well. And uh, <clears throat> here's where I would express a great deal of <coughs> intellectual humility. These two uh, projects in Europe, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and European integration initially around the common market, really grew up together. So I wonder if they can be separated quite this easily. That's the, uh, that's really the simple question. Thank you. Um, I've just moved back to the States after 20 something years of living abroad, including Macedonia and Brussels and Spain. So it's just uh, And just a few months ago, we got to a spring conference at the on whether something in Europe can be and the, there were many, many answers to that question, but uh, the participants said that, that they wanted to join the European Union. They're not even talking about the United States of Europe, but the European Union, because they saw that if they were able to join, they imagined greater prosperity. Uh, they didn't really imagine greater political developments or greater rule of law. And in fact, they're seeing that the pressures to conform economically are leading to less rule of law and more corruption, and consequently, fewer chances of actually being admitted. The, the chances of accession, and we, were, we had participants from Macedonia, and from Kosovo, from Albania, from, and from Bosnia, we didn't have any, from Serbia and Montenegro. Um, but you know, they, they really felt that they were very unlikely to join the European Union. And the consequence of their being excluded, either temporarily or indefinitely, most of them imagine <coughs> going on indefinitely, is that uh, they would be politically worse off, and that the repercussions for Europe, for the European Union, would be increasing effects of organized crime, trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think the question is necessarily, are the European countries in the Union ready 
to consider a United States of Europe, but even on the current level of development of the EU, is it really able to function successfully and to integrate the countries that aren't even members of the EU yet? And I thought your, your point about you know, freedom of mobility was spot on because people are getting concessions of it, being able to move you know, physically, but not commercially. And uh, when they do move physically, they don't necessarily do it uh, with the best results. So I think you know, the question is really, uh, is there a concept of Europe, let alone the European Union, let alone the United States of Europe? I think the European so let, let me Europe is still, yeah. you know, in Let me try and start on that into a, a question yeah. about, I'll, I'll pass it on. Um, so we've already gone too far. We're continuing to bring in, to, or at least pretend to bring in countries. And one of the ones that's like this is Turkey often refers to itself as the permanent bridesmaid. Because Turkey has been held out as being the candidate member forever. Now you can bring in Macedonia, all the rest of it. This, this obviously has a negative feedback effect into the, the politics of Europe itself. So let me I'll ask a much more pointed question. Would a United States of Europe, however configured, be more sustainable if it was smaller and focused around a core group of countries? Many people in Germany, not many people, several people in Germany have made the point that a northern European euro bloc would actually be sustainable. And we basically just could try to integrate too many, two different economies. Is that a view that you would subscribe to? Or would you say, no, you have to get rid of the euro but keep the EU? No, no. Uh, the idea that uh, the northern countries could well organize and sustain a common currency is as a matter from us. Uh, uh, so, and we did this uh, before the euro came. We had the European currency system. Every time the Deutsche Bundesbank uh, revalued the Deutsche Mark, next day, the shilling and the gulder was and the crown was revalued, and that for 15 years, which tells you that a common currency can work if you have the same fiscal, uh, uh, the, the same fiscal discipline. That is uh, to that. So, and as far as currency is concerned, I could see that. And by the way, that's the answer to also to your question when you said, uh, "Can we un unwind this without blowing this whole thing up?" Yes, we can by uh, by countries with the same kind of discipline, and then focusing on perhaps on maintaining a northern Europe, as we call it. On the other hand, uh, the more we deepen Euro Europe the less likely and the more difficult it is to expand it. Those politicians who always say, we want both, we want a deeper Europe and a wider Europe, are a smoking pot, because it is, it is a contradiction. The, the deeper Europe is, the less likely it is that Macedonia will join it. So I'm in favor of less deep and wider which is in line with my idea of or our idea of a common market based uh, system with of course not only common market there are many other things which we can uh, which we can do get out of the euro now you know if uh, dave mckinney now has to travel by car tomorrow to new york so he let's assume he he gets on the 95 and after 2 hours he reads uh, uh, toronto so now he can say, look, Nancy, we have driven for two hours. Let's go on to Toronto. Uh, or he can say, for Christ's sake, I made a mistake. and make a U-turn. So the longer it takes getting out of the euro, the more difficult it will be. I, I agree with that. But we have to make that U-turn, because at the end, we will hit the wall. There has never been a common currency. There have been many in the history. There has never been one current common currency ever surviving. They all folded up. Here first, and then over there. Uh, thank you, Angle, for a very interesting talk. So if the euro is such a bad deal for the southern countries, according to you and to you, Mark, too, then to me, one of the biggest puzzles in the euro crisis is why there is so little resistance to the euro in those screwed southern countries. Yes, you have um, parties like Syriza, Podemos, Chikli, Stella, and whatnot, who are so-called protest parties and make a lot of fuss. But they're against austerity, right? They're not against the euro. Why do you think that is? Well, <clears throat> let me take the example of the last rescue package for Greece. Uh, uh, it was then, Varoufakis was not anymore in charge, but uh, no government ever made the Greece and gave a, the Greece an offer. 
You may remember that the majority of the finance ministers of the Eurozone was aware of the opinion this time, we let them go. It was then for Merkel who, under pressure again from the French and Renzi from Italy, said, okay, no, uh, we, want, uh, we want them to stay. Now, uh, and the Greek government wanted to stay. But had the Greek government been offered by the German government a total relief of all the credits and all the things which we have piled up in terms of uh, possible uh, payments, the situation would have been different. The prime minister could have gone back to his country and said, oh, Germany uh, forgoes all the loans and all the credits. And that's an achievement my government has uh, achieved. And now I can come up with the drachme, I devalue, and suddenly the Greek economy can start to grow again. Now, the reason why the, uh, the Germans don't do this is because they would have to do something which I did, and they don't do. They don't want to admit having made a mistake. Because it is like, assume you have a bank and you have a, 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 a Greece as a debtor, you, and, and, and you have given him a lot of money, you loaned him a lot of money, you would have not had that money valued at 100% in your balance sheet. But Mr. Schäuble, our finance minister, has it still at 100% in his balance sheet. So in order to get the Greece to accept to get out, we should pay a very expensive exit ticket. That is our position. That's our party's position. And you know what? It doesn't cost anything because the money is gone. There is not a single, there is not a single, I don't know any, any economist who believes we ever get the money back. There is none. But it is there at 100% in the German balance sheet. And the German politicians, Frau Merkel, in the, in the first place, has to admit, oh boy, I made a mistake, and now we have to. And suddenly, this balanced budget, of which Herr Schäuble is very proud of, is gone. So uh, that's the reason. I'm, I'm going to just put something in here before we go here that I think is, is germane. Um, I gave a talk in DC about a year and a half ago, uh, just when the Greece thing was about to become big again. And a number of Greeks in the audience, and one of them said very passionately to me that it was very wrong, because I was making the same claim, essentially, just cut, get out, go. And they said, no, we can't. And they used a particular way of talking about this, which I've also heard in Spain and I've also heard in Portugal. The only good thing that's ever happened in our politics has come out because we joined the EU. So in other words, Brussels can clean house with local elites and can create sustainable systems of representation and taxation and can keep the military out of politics in a way in which local elites can't because it creates a zero-sum game. So they will stay in despite the cost because for them, the euro is a, an encumbrance, but the benefits of being in, in terms of governance, outweigh it. Now, I, I don't have a position on this. I'm just reporting what I've heard but that seems to be germane with what you're saying, and also another reason why there's a lock in to this Hotel California problem, if you will, with the euro. And now over here. Um, so it seems to me the status quo is uh, unsustainable right now, specifically for economic reasons, at least. Um, specifically because uh, monetary entities and fiscal entities are, con uh, are not conjoined right now, as they are in the United States, where we have like a Federal Reserve and then a Congress, and then uh, subsequently uh, many states that have their own budgets. Um, so why is this not an argument for uh, a United States of Europe, though? Because um, if we uh, move in the opposite direction, where instead of breaking down Europe, um, we uh, bring a fiscal entity that conjoins uh, the ECB and uh, uh, a fiscal entity that can spend and money finance its own, its own um, uh, expenditures. Nick, do you want to kick off on why that's never going to happen? I mean, other than, I, I, I suppose you can say political and cultural reasons. I think it could happen, but it's a huge jump right. from where we are now. It would be a rewriting of European integration from about 1957 onward, uh, following the directives of a long-forgotten French social minister, Guy Mollet, who actually proposed a welfare state at the European level. So it would be. Um, I think a huge change. What I could imagine, um, if the political will were present, would be not a move toward uh, 
full United States of Europe, but an expansion of the EU's fiscal capability by raising uh, contributions. I don't see the political support for this, but it would be uh, more like a 5, 7, 10 percent contribution of GDP from the member countries. And then I think you could have a fiscal capability which would work more like the fiscal capability in the United States. And it's true that we don't have bailouts in the United States in the sense that the uh, subnational states in the United States have to run balanced budgets, they fund their, uh, <coughs> their debt markets separately, but in another sense through U.S. social policy, in fact, California, New York, and Massachusetts are, are indeed bailing out Arkansas and Mississippi <coughs> almost every day because those states are receiving so much more from Washington than they pay in in tax dollars. Now, these are, between the European Union as it now stands and the United States, these are examples of uh, fiscal relationships which are very, very far apart. Uh, we can't simply have um, a, a couple of budgeters figure out how to bring them together. It would necessarily be a very complex uh, political uh, process, but I think it's one which we could uh, nonetheless um, uh, think about if we wanted to. Uh, can I follow up? Um, so it seems that the percent contribution that you talked about uh, would uh, sort of um, counteract the system that we have in the United States that's so efficient, where we're able to have like California subsidize Maine, for example. It seems like um, you're, you're putting a specific constraint on these uh, countries on contributing a specific amount, of, of, albeit according to GDP but it, it seems too constrained uh, compared to the United States system, which, I mean, as an American, I find efficient, but maybe I'm biased. Before I bring in Dr. Eagle on this one, just, it, it's also very undemocratic because no one in New York actually knows that they're bailing out someone else. So yeah, there is a democracy right. angry on this but one. But the, the second one is actually most of it for the fiscal side is actually very much overestimated. If you actually look at work on this, most of the adjustment in the United States comes through two things, labor mobility. And the second one is adjustment through capital markets. <coughs> So, you know, the fact that you've got fidelity accounts and retirement accounts, you can move from Florida to Maine, portable money, is actually about, the estimates are about 70% of the adjustment versus the fiscal stuff. So, you know, this, this could be overblown. Do you have anything you wish to add on this? Well, I would like to warn that we overdo the Schengen, uh, the importance of Schengen. Uh, uh, Schengen is uh, a border control system. We have freedom of movement of labor in Europe. That's most important. And uh, the UK, uh, Britain, never adhered to Schengen. So if you go to London, you, you go to the airport, you have to show your passport, that's all. So you show your passport, so what? If you go to Switzerland, you, uh, are, you could, if you go by car, every 50th car is being taken out and the, you show your passport, that's all. So Schengen is not so important. Important is a free movement of labor, which we should Continue, but on the idea of a common social Europe, uh, we now have the precise recommendation of the French Minister of Social Affairs to combine the German and the French unemployment system. Now, if you were a French Minister of, un of, of Labour, you would think that's a great idea, with an unemployment of <laughs> yeah of 12 percent, and a Germany has less than five. So uh, the, now the Italian minister says that's a good idea. We would also p like to put our... <laughs> well, you, you laugh. And the European Commission has now officially said we are going to come up with a proposal to socialize the unemployment system in Europe, mm -hmm. which is, again, if everybody is responsible, I say nobody is responsible. Interestingly enough, the French do not want to put their... Uh, their uh, pension system into a European fund because they have much more children than Germany. So they say, well, that is something very national. So this should be kept in France. Mm -hmm. And on the democracy, I think this is a very important point. Let's f not forget the 1.2% uh, uh, which we are collecting now in Europe and redistributing is, ha has three elements which the euro system does not have. Number one, it is democratically controlled. 
each national parliament votes for it. Number two, it is for a specific purpose. It is for either a highway in Spain or it is for a common research project in Europe. So we know for what. And number three, it is capped as one at 1.2 percent. Whereas the European Central Bank now prints money like hell and it nobody knows for what, nobody knows who's paying, and this bank is anything but democratically controlled. I mean, you should realize that we have in the European Central Bank, there is the system of each country has one vote. So the German representative of that of our Deutsche Bundesbank has the same vote as the person from Cyprus or Malta or Luxembourg. This is democracy. I thought that democracy has something to do with the number of votes each representative can, can sort of bring along. And by the way, uh, because there are no more uh, countries in the Eurozone than there are seats, there is occasionally the, uh, the, the period where the, even the German uh, representative can't vote, like right now. And uh, so you are in, in the situation that the potential debtor countries always outvote, always, the few creditor countries, which is Germany, Netherlands, uh, Austria, and Finland. They are constantly outvoted. So, uh, you know, they. We, we lost control of the sort of thing. <coughs> At the back. Uh, two questions, Professor Hankel, and then by all means. Um, both relating to the euro in particular. The first is, I don't have a good sense as to how widespread your views are, both within the eurozone in general and in Germany in particular. Are you, like, a voice yes. crying in the wilderness, or are you uh, <coughs> just that? And the second is, if um, tomorrow morning everyone said, you know, you're right, we got to unwind this thing, um, I don't have a sense as to how easy or complicated it would be to, in fact, unwind the euro, and how long it would take, and, and what all is involved. Yes. Well, it's a very good question. Well, let me first say that um, <clears throat> the German public is um, it's uh, strange. They, they are now in favor of keeping the euro because Frau Merkel has very effectively s said if the euro, euro fails, Europe fails. I, in my little speech, tried to tell you that that has nothing to do with each other. But the public generally believes. So uh, the majority of the Germans, I would say about 55, 60 percent, want to keep the euro. On the other hand, each time a bailout package is being agreed upon, a huge majority, 85 percent, say, oh, no, we should not bail out Greece. So this is a, uh, how do you call this? Uh, uh, this is a crazy, crazy situation. The Germans like to keep the euro but do not want to save it. It doesn't make any sense. So and now you go to the German parliament where we have 633 deputies. There's only one deputy officially against the euro. That is Frau Wagenknecht from the Communist Party. Only one. In the European Parliament, it is about one third of those who don't want the euro. Like, there's not a single politician in Great Britain I know of who wants the euro. There's not a single Czech party who wants the euro. Bulgaria doesn't want the euro. Denmark doesn't want it. No party. Uh, Sweden and so on. And within the euro, countries, within the other Euro countries, you have a lot of, oh, you have a lot, you have some people opposing it. Germany is the last country to leave the Euro. I tell you that. Uh, so uh, under four eyes, however, uh, there is hardly a CEO I meet who says, Mr. Henkel, you're right. Then I say, why don't you say it publicly? He says, oh, wait a minute, Our, we have a responsibility for Europe and all this. So there is a I would say there's a very strange situation in my country, uh, which I don't want to explain now here. It is a tough thing. I, I always say Germany belongs on the couch. It, it, <laughs> it, is, it has something to do with our history, that we feel we have got to save Euro, uh, the Europe, if the Euro fails. We have, to, we have to ask, we are the last country to close the borders. 
against, you know, all the other countries are now clo have now closed the borders to the refugees. And Frau Merkel says, you should not have closed the borders. Yet, she says, look, my policy works. Nobody is coming anymore. So this is the same thing as I said, we love the euro, but we don't want to save it. So it's, uh, I, say, I must say, uh, Germany is not, uh, still suffers from its past and is unable, in my view, to, uh, to, to uh, follow a, a logical path. Very often it is derailed by references to the terrible things which happened between 33 and 45. Uh, going to go twenty first and then here. Um, it, let's leave aside the euro for a moment and uh, let's stipulate that maybe we should be unwinding the euro. But the discussion now is shifted beyond uh, the euro as the, the borders, the refugee crisis. And I'm curious what you let's say you're right um, to save Europe we need to get rid of the euro. What is this new Europe going to do, and how does it relate to the rise of some very illiberal, bordering on dictatorship type European yes. states that are emerging, and which the refugee crisis, the inability to deal with, is uh, accelerating? So what is this? What is the politics of a Europe, Europe without a Europe? Well, <clears throat> as I said before, I think Europe would be better off if we didn't have the Euro. And uh, uh, what worries me first is we have not discussed this, but it is really, really, this is the final blow. If on the, This is very likely. It's not unlikely, I should say. You are the better expert. But if on June 23rd, Great Britain says we go, then we have a new situation. And I am, uh, as I said, uh, if I, I am for Cameron here, and I uh, really support Cameron's view of Europe. Uh, Cameron says this is too much, too far, too centralized, too harmonized. You know, let's step back. And that's exactly the road, uh, the road we should all take. Rather than them following Britain, we push out Britain, as a matter of fact. And I think Britain has a good case, because they did not sign up for the centralization and harmonization in Brussels. It is a result of the euro. So the, the argument for keeping uh, the, the Britain is, for me, very important. So if Britain leaves, then we have a totally, you can forget the euro. It's irrelevant for me. Then if Britain leaves, you will have Finland following. There is a likelihood that. Uh, uh, Scandinavia says, okay, we'll do this as well. This whole thing could break up. And maybe that's a good thing. It could be a good thing. There are some guys who say, some politicians who say, look, this is so messed up. We need, somebody needs to throw a bomb in there and then let's start. And this could be a, a result of a negative ref referendum. Scotland is a, a difficult issue as well. I, I realize that. So, and now on the uh, dictatorships, look, uh, for me it was very interesting. I must get, come back to the EU. Uh, the three Baltic states, the people in the Baltic states did not want the euro. The governments did it, and you know why? Because of Putin. The government said, look, anything which we can do, which separates us even more from what used to be the Soviet Union, is good for us. So this, uh, this situation with those dictatorships and the Ukraine is really the, 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 the boiling pot at the moment because there you have corruption, you don't have my triangle, you have, uh, you have uh, okay, you have some sort of a democracy, but you have... Uh, uh, I think Poland is the more dangerous case at the moment. The, the well, look... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think so. Dangerous <laughs> is that these policies, I criticize result in uh, the resurrection of rightist parties all over Europe. By the way, also in, in Poland and in my country. That is a byproduct 
of Frau Merkel's policy, no question. In Germany, this party, which has now gained 12 percent in the three elections, was dead when we left it, totally dead, it, in the polls less than 3 percent. And now it has 12 to 24 percent. And it is only because of the refugee policy of Frau Merkel. So uh, uh, we can discuss now the refugee policy, but uh, there are lots of threats to Europe. For me, the and by the way, the refugee policy of Frau Merkel may also be the final blow to Britain's membership in the EU. Because uh, surprisingly many of the conservatives are now even the leader of the political group in the European Parliament, in which I am. This leader has now publicly said, I want to get out. This is a major blow to those stay-ins. Uh, and uh, you, know, you know about the mayor of London who wants to get out. This is an extremely, an extremely dangerous thing. They, uh, getting out of the euro is nothing as compared to letting Britain go. I've got one, time for one more question, but I want to get on something. We've been skirting around the migrant crisis, so I want to put this firmly on the table, right? So by another, I accept all you're saying, but let's twist it another way. So Europe is old. The average age of your average European is 43 years old. Uh, the replacement rate of the German population is 1.4. And that means in a little over 16 years, France will be the same size of economy simply by having more people. So we know this is the, the <coughs> demographic story. Germany has very expensive pensions. And on those replacement rates, you're not going to be able to pay them, even if you have the Schwarz and Null and all the rest, the trickery at the, at the finance minister. So 25% of these migrants are children who are unaccompanied. They're not much of a security threat. Then you've got the others who are coming in. And if you add up everyone in the European Union, it's 436 million people. So 2 million people coming in on 436. I mean, at the end of the war, when Germany was on its knees, quite literally, two million people went from the Sudetenland and came into the south. So we've done this before. Greece has done this in the 1990s with the collapse of the Soviet Union. They took in one million refugees. So we're in this weird position now where Europe desperately needs young workers who are eager and want to work. And we have these huge liabilities on our balance sheets. And we have a small number of people, relatively speaking, to absorb. And this is going to blow the European Union apart. What is going I do not understand that. Look, I, I do understand it, quite frankly. Uh, first of all, uh, the immigrants who come to the United States have been chosen by the United States, un unless you talk about the illegal immigrants. Uh, we are the only country where the immigrants choose the country. Uh, and uh, from those 1 million who came last year, 1.1 million, uh, I think 45% are analphabets, technically spoken. And the typical immigrant who comes to the United Kingdom speaks English. The typical immigrant who came or comes to France speaks French. Those people don't speak German. That is a colossal, sorry? Well, but he was, he was just making an immigrant argument. I was making a migration argument, but your point is but, well uh, taken. No, These are refugees. They have a different yeah, status. What in German? I mean, come on. Yes. Let me just uh, make the, the point. Uh, those refugees who come to France speak French. And those refugees who come to the UK speak English. Those refugees who come to Germany don't speak German. So this is a, a big of a difference. By the way, they don't even use our alphabet. And to think that now uh, this, this is a fantastic solution to our uh, a demographic problem is a little naive. I am always in favor of a more liberal immigration system, and it is part of our party program, but I always use the Canadian system, immigration system, as a model, where the government decides who comes and why, and how many. And here, nobody uh, comes and decides, and uh, uh, um, has, has, as I said, we have no control. Because they are no, they are coming. This is not so simple. They are coming without any. They are coming without any. You were talking about the war. This is not true. Wait a minute. It is true. It is just true. No, most of let's be civilized. Most most of those refugees come from very unhygienic and very uncomfortable camps where there is no fighting. They come from camps and. In Jordania, in Iraq, and Turkey, they do not come from areas where it's being fighting. And if if it was so, then tell me why 72 percent 
of those who come are men. And why they leave in those fighting areas, their, their women, their wives, their daughters, and so on, alone. So let's, and please. Please, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. My, my point is only, this is, yes. this is a different immigrant situation than is the one which we had before, after the war. There, there were Germans that spoke German. One more question coming from here, and then we'll go to John for. I haven't, I haven't heard, uh, I remember a, a great deal of, uh, of uh, inefficiency and, and, you know, the 26 different national currencies. Uh, it seems to me that you're saying that because we can't manage the economic affairs slightly differently, more uh, flexibly between those members of the European Union, we want to go back to the 26 different currencies that were very inconvenient, very ineffective, very uh, 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 not in keeping with uh, 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 building growth uh, of, of all the, the, the countries in the European region. Is that unfair for me to say? Yes, <clears throat> um, I think so. Uh, all the statistics I have show that uh, those countries which maintain their own currencies have done so much better in the European Union. And uh, the idea that you need a one-size-fits-all currency for all, I mean, look, I, I, was, I was buying some underwear earlier here. Uh, you know, imagine you buy a shirt and, and you have only one size. Uh, uh, this doesn't work. Uh, for, you would have been able to buy it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, but, but as I said, but as I said, if you, if you have different economic systems, different democratic systems, we don't have a European uh, a government which is elected uh, by, uh, by the people. So if you have a different democratic system uh, and then one currency which is organized by a bank which, is, uh, which has nobody above him, it cannot work. Uh, so the, what you call inefficient system uh, I must say is yeah it was inefficient that because you had to you had to change money or take Germany most of our exports go to the United States we have no co common currency with the United States the second largest export market for us is China this is we don't need a common currency for exporting to China and we didn't need a common currency to export to France so this uh, benefit of having to uh, save the, the money which you gave the banks for changing the money is rather irrelevant to the enormous disadvantages which a one-size-fits-all currency has. I just don't remember it that way. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, uh, I, I IBM, look, uh, when, I, when I was uh, in IBM Europe, uh, we had all these different currencies, and the company thrived. It was wonderful. Uh, Yes, we, we uh, uh, finally we put all the money into dollars uh, according to the exchange rate, and that was it. So We've come to the end of our session. I want to thank Hans Olaf Henkel, Mark Blythe, Nick Ziegler. Uh, it, it would sound flip of me to say a thank you for a, a spirited conversation, although it was spirited. But I, more seriously, I felt that this was a very meaningful discussion about a number of issues that are, are um, vexing all of us, institutions in Europe and North America, they're not functioning in the way that many of us dream. Whether we're on the left, the center, the right, they're not functioning and we're all searching for solutions. I think this discussion amongst everybody in the room reflected that kind of search. So I want to thank you all as well for participating, for participating very civilly and, and uh, in an intellectually very creative fashion. This is exactly the kind of thing we at the Watson Institute hope to do more of in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you.